Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> okay, two things. I am not good with microphones, so if you can't hear me, just like scream. And if any tech goes wrong, it's on me and not them. They set it up. Okay. All right. One week before the 2016 election, I submitted an article to the Journal of Southern Religion. Years in the making, I can be slow. I offered an analysis of Declaration of Independence orations in South Carolina from 1820 to 1840. My working thesis was that on a day of national patriotism, pro-slavery Southerners intentionally limited the title of patriot to those who thought as they did. A day celebrating freedom could not be taken literally, otherwise slave-based culture would be un-American. For the orators, even to suggest such a thing was both un-American and un-Christian. What had finally moved the article from my head to my pencil and paper was the June 2015 shooting at Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Dylan Roof's choice of South Carolina as the place to start, in his words, a race war, was based on antebellum Southern history. South Carolina was one of the only slave states with a majority black population, and Emanuel AME had been the church of Denmark Vesey, he of the 1822 attempted slave revolt. I began my article with the shooting. When I received my first set of comments, one reviewer stated that the Charleston shooting was unconnected to the pro-slavery and pro-American rhetoric that I apparently had analyzed well. I was told to develop a different opening paragraph, so I did. But my initial instincts were right. I revised my Journal of Southern Religion article in the late winter and early spring of 2017, when some folks had finally stopped ugly crying and started worrying. Was President Donald Trump's language about minorities truly how he felt, or was he simply using really old dog whistles? I don't think anyone can answer the first part of the question, because intent is almost impossible for an outsider to determine. But regarding the second part of the question, bigoted language about race and American identity has not really changed since the 19th century. The medium changes. Now we have Facebook and Twitter. The message does not. At least that's the argument I plan to make, using President Trump as a case study. I will rely primarily on two sources of information, at real Donald Trump and video of speeches. Thanks to the Trump Twitter archive, I was able to access old tweets and I wanted to focus not on commentary about the president's words, but on the words themselves, with one exception. George Will argues that the president's, quote, historical ignorance deprives him of the satisfaction of working in a house where much magnificent history has been made, end quote. Based on the president's responses to three events, the violence in Charlottesville, Virginia in August of 2017, the NFL's 2017 season, and the mass shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in October 2018, I will argue the following. President Trump consistently fails to recognize the realities of racism and bigotry, whether historical or contemporary. The ignorance or lack of recognition leads to defensiveness, which is often a white majority response to an increasingly minority world. The title of my talk comes from Langston Hughes's poem, I Too. In it, Hughes waits for the day when America will recognize its darker brother, who will, quote, sit at the table. Additionally, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. While people of color no longer have to eat in the kitchen when company comes, as Hughes notes in his poem, recognition as Americans has been much slower to come. The historic election of Senator Barack Obama as president in 2008 suggested a transformation in American culture and politics, and yet, President Obama's eight years in office coincided with the rise of the Tea Party and the revitalization of white supremacist groups, some now identifying themselves as the alt-right. The claim that President Obama is a Muslim socialist from Kenya had, and still has, a specific purpose, to challenge his identity and, by extension, his supporters' identities as an American. For white supremacists, the title of American historically has belonged to whites only. In the 19th century, even those who favored abolition of African slaves hesitated when considering whether such slaves could one day be citizens, hence the rise of the American Colonization Society and the establishment of the African country of Liberia. And when white American identity has pres been presumed to be under threat, the response historically has been violence. Race riots and lynchings are only two examples. Violence, however, rarely occurs without a rhetorical buildup. The events of August 2017 in Charlottesville, Virginia are a case in point. The Unite the Right rally's ostensible purpose was to protest the removal of a statue of Robert E. Lee from Emancipation Park. The event was supposed to take place on Saturday, August 12th from noon to 5 p.m. 
But the night before, a group of around 250 decided to march on the University of Virginia campus. Carrying tiki torches and shouting Nazi slogans, the group ran to a small group of counter-protesters. The first fight in what became a bloody weekend began. Notice, however, the almost seamless combination of active racism and religious bias demonstrated by the marchers. The men, mostly men, are in Virginia to advocate for Robert E. Lee's monument. Statistically, most Confederate monuments appeared well after the Civil War as a way to glorify the South's past and to suggest that the past would be the future. They literally were displays of white power. When marching, however, the men chanted, quote, Jews will not replace us, end quote. This seeming incongruity, Jewish people had zero to do with the Confederate monument, may not be incongruous at all. The connection between white supremacy and anti-Judaism has historical roots, and the marchers might have known that the mayor at the time, Michael Signer, is Jewish. But in context, the march was about a local situation that did not involve the people being chanted against. The rally itself never happened. By mid-morning, the presence of white nationalists, counter-protesters, and a militia made for a toxic mix. When violence broke out, the assembly was declared unlawful. In the hours that followed, one counter-protester and two police officers lost their lives. At 12.19 p.m., after the assembly was disbanded, but before Heather Heyer was killed, President Trump tweeted, quote, we all must be united and condemn all that hate stands for. There is no place for this kind of violence in America. Let's come together as one, end quote. 41 minutes later, he noted that he was in Bedminster, New Jersey, but Charlottesville sad. By 323, the president called for a swift restoration of law and order and the protection of innocent lives, hashtag Charlottesville. It was already too late for Heather Heyer. Approximately 10 minutes later, the president spoke in New Jersey and mentioned Charlottesville. Y'all better pray about this text. For the record, I am a Guardian subscriber, so I don't feel guilty about Xing that out. But we're closely following the terrible events unfolding in Charlottesville, Virginia. We condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence on many sides. On many sides. It's been going on for a long time in our country. Not Donald Trump, not Barack Obama. It's been going on for a long, long time. What is vital now is a swift restoration of law and order and the protection of innocent lives. No citizen should ever fear for their safety and security in our society. And no child should ever be afraid to go outside. I just got off the phone with the governor of Virginia, Terry McCullough, and we agreed that the hate and the division must stop, and must stop right now. We have to come together as Americans with love for our nation, and true affection, and really, and I, I say this so strongly, true affection for each other. When I watch Charlottesville, to me it's very, very sad. Above all else, we must remember this truth. No matter our color, creed, religion, or political party, we are all Americans first. We want to get the situation straightened out in Charlottesville, and we want to study it. And we want to see what we're doing wrong as a country where things like this can happen. We have to heal the wounds of our country. These are wounds that have been going on for really a long time, and I thought, and everybody thought, and everybody wants it to heal, and it will heal, and we're gonna make every effort possible to make sure that that healing procedure goes as quickly as possible. I love the people of our country. I love all of the people of our country. We're gonna make America great again, but we're going to make it great for all of the people 
of the United States of America. Thank you very much. Thank you. In spite of the litany of economic accomplishments by his administration, which he talked about in the full statement, his call for American unity and the statement that he would make America great again for all seemed to fit the occasion. If Charlottesville showed Americans tearing each other apart, the president offered a path to come together. That path, however, would be overshadowed by one of his opening comments, which condemned, quote, hatred, violence, and bigotry on many sides, on many sides, end quote. The statement misses an important historical point. White American supremacists have used violence as a means to intimidate and in some cases eliminate those who challenged their authority. There are not many sides here, only one. While the counter protesters also had weapons, by all accounts, the members of the Unite the Right rally started both the physical confrontation on the University of Virginia campus and the violence at the rally site the following day. We can argue whether the counter protesters should have taken a nonviolent approach. What is less debatable is whether there is a moral equivalency between those chanting blood and soil and those wanting such chanters to get out of their community. President Trump's many sides claim, along with the argument that the problems Charlottesville exemplified predate him and President Obama, miss the point. There are those who hold racist and anti-Semitic views, and there are those who don't. They are not two sides of a coin. The many sides comment ended up undoing the rest of his otherwise on point tweets that day. Less than an hour later, the president tweeted again, directly from his earlier verbal comments, quote, we must remember this truth. No matter our color, creed, religion, or political party, we are all Americans first, end quote. In the next two hours, President Trump tweeted condolences to the Virginia State Police and the families of the two officers killed in the helicopter crash, as well as to those injured in the car crash that took the life of Heather Heyer. The president's tweets displayed an awareness of events and a timely and admirable call for unity. The leadership was badly needed and much appreciated. But the tweets did not make up for two days of silence after the many sides comment. By the morning of August 14th, chaos seemed to reign. Ken Frazier of Merck Pharmaceuticals resigned his position on the president's manufacturing council. Appropriately enough, he did so on Twitter, writing, quote, American leaders must honor our fundamental values by clearly rejecting expressions of hatred, bigotry, and group supremacy, which run counter to the American ideal that all people are created equal." End quote. The president responded by saying that Frazier would now have more time to lower rip-off drug prices. With folks still up in arms, however, President Trump made a statement early that afternoon that did what he failed to do on Saturday, which is to condemn white supremacists. Racism is evil, and those who cause violence in its name are criminals and thugs, including the KKK, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and other hate groups that are repugnant to everything we hold dear as America. We are a nation founded on the truth that all of us are created equal. We are equal in the eyes of our Creator. We are equal under the law and we are equal under our Constitution. Using the Declaration of Independence, just as Mr. Frazier did, the President argued for all Americans being equal under the law and under God, rejecting the Ku Klux Klan, neo-Nazis, and white supremacist argument of non-white inferiority. In the full video, which is five minutes long, reporters shouted out to the president about whether he regretted not condemning white supremacists earlier. That shouting might explain two of his late afternoon tweets. The first insisted again that Merck should lower prices, and I'm trying not to shout, it's all in caps. Um, the second is as follows. Made additional remarks on Charlottesville and realized once again that the hashtag fake news media will never be satisfied. Truly bad people. The president was right that some people would never be satisfied by his comments, probably because they came too late. With a 24-hour news cycle, two days of silence is almost the equivalent of two weeks. 
If I had chosen to talk about the media's response to the president's comments on the 12th, this would have been a four-part lecture series. The reaction was swift, consistent, and almost exclusively negative, with the exception of Fox News. I looked. Condemning violent white supremacists should have been the easy part of his job. The tweet sounded like he wanted some sort of reward or acknowledgement for doing what he could have done two days prior. And the fallout continued. By the morning of the 15th, more people were leaving the president's manufacturing council. In his seventh tweet of the morning, but last tweet of the day, President Trump wrote, for every CEO that drops out of the manufacturing council, I have many to take their place. Grand standards should not have gone on. Jobs. Whoever would have wanted to take their place, however, probably dropped out as a consequence of an early afternoon press conference. his blame on both sides. What about the alt-left that came charging at the, as you say, the alt-right? Do they have any semblance of guilt? I've condemned many different groups, but not all of those people were neo-Nazis, believe me. Not all of those people were white supremacists by any stretch. Those people were also there because they wanted to protest the taking down of a statue, Robert E. Lee. So, excuse me. And you take a look at some of the groups, and you see, and you know it if you were honest reporters, which in many cases you're not. But many of those people were there to protest the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. So, this week it's Robert E. Lee. I noticed that Stonewall Jackson's coming down. I wonder, is it George Washington next week? And is it Thomas Jefferson the week after? You know, you, all, you really do have to ask yourself, where does it stop? <laughs> George Washington was a slave owner. Was George Washington a slave owner? So will George Washington now lose his status? Are we going to take down, excuse me, are we going to take down, are we going to take down statues to George Washington? Uh, racial relations in America. Do you think things have gotten worse or better since he took off? They've been frayed for a long time. And you can ask President Obama about that because he makes speeches about it. Can I ask you, President, are you putting what you're calling the alt-left and white supremacists on the same moral plane? I'm not putting anybody on a moral plan. What I'm saying is this. You had a group on one side and you had a group on the other and they came at each other with clubs and it was vicious and it was horrible and it was a horrible thing to watch. The return to the both sides argument is an expansion and a contraction. I will begin with the contraction. President Trump repeated his earlier claim that he condemned hatred, violence, and bigotry while leaving out on many sides. That small contraction allowed him to expand his definition of who the many sides are. He decided in the full video, which is about 12 minutes, and just know, um, that there are two of them. In one corner, you had those who were peacefully protesting the removal of Robert E. Lee's statue and the renaming of Lee Park to Emancipation Park. Not all of the protesters were neo-Nazis or white supremacists, and it was unfair to categorize them as such. Instead, they were defending history. If the Lee statue and statues of Stonewall Jackson disappear, slave owners George Washington and Thomas Jefferson might be next. Again, we have a false equivalency. Washington and Jefferson worked to create the United States. Lee and Jackson worked to divide it by fighting for the Confederacy, arguing that we are not one nation. It is one thing to acknowledge the reality of American slave owners. It is another to glorify a failed rebellion. What is perhaps most disturbing was the claim that the Friday evening march was quiet. While President Trump said he saw the same images as reporters and even knew more about them, he must not have heard the slogans. In the other corner, you have members of the alt-left. According to the president, gathering without a permit, wearing black, and violently attacking the other side. The Washington Post gave the president four Pinocchios for his suggestion that the counter-protesters needed a permit to attend the rally on Saturday. They had permission to gather, but did not need one to go into a public park. 
While the president claimed twice that he was not trying to create a moral equivalency between the alt-right and the alt-left, even snapping at a reporter in the full video to define the alt-right, he effectively made an equivalency. When David Duke thanks you for saying critical truths about BLM and Antifa, you perhaps should ask yourself if that was what you meant to say. The question is not a hypothetical one because buried in the chaos of the press conference was a helpful point. When asked what might improve race relations, the president responded jobs and economic opportunity. He very well might be right. Historically, race has often been used to mask class. Poor white people could see themselves as better than non-whites even if they couldn't feed their families. And people of color struggled against labor laws and policies that blocked the path to self-sufficiency. When folks on all sides can take care of themselves, perhaps there will be less to fight about. But the fear of limited goods and the envy of those who seem to have more than you has often motivated past racial segregation and current rhetoric against immigrants, documented or undocumented. Focusing more upon economics may have spared the president even more fallout. On the morning of the 16th, the president disbanded the Manufacturing Council and the Strategy and Policy Forum, quote, rather than putting pressure on the business people, end quote. It appeared that the business people simply wanted to distance themselves from the president's comments. By the morning of the 17th, perhaps because he did not receive the positive press he expected, the president took to Twitter to complain. Quote, publicity-seeking Lindsey Graham falsely stated that I said there is moral equivalency between the KKK, neo-Nazis, and white supremacists, and people like Ms. Heyer. Such a disgusting lie. He just can't forget his election trouncing. The people of South Carolina will remember. The public is learning even more so how dishonest the fake news is. They totally misrepresent what I say about hate, bigotry, etc. Shame. The problem, as we have noted, is that by suggesting that the counter-protesters should take some responsibility for the events, the president appeared to be minimizing the role of white supremacists who specifically targeted Charlottesville as a place to gather and proclaim their message. Again, we can argue about whether the counter-protesters should have been armed, but their purpose was a different one than that of the men with the tiki torches. The president, however, might actually have created a moral equivalency with his next set of tweets. I'm quoting directly. Sad to see the history and culture of our great country being ripped apart with the removal of our beautiful statues and monuments. You can't change history, but you can learn from it. Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson. Who's next? Washington? Jefferson? So foolish. Also, the beauty that is being taken out of our cities, towns, and parks will be greatly missed and never able to be comparably replaced. Where do I begin? <laughs> I will work backwards. For African Americans, there is no beauty in those statues. Most of them were put up between 1890 and 1950. They served as a glorification of white supremacy and a warning to stay in your place. Had the monuments been installed right after the Civil War, as an historian, I'd argue that they should remain as invaluable primary sources for the Reconstruction era. The monuments, however, are a testament to the Nader and Jim Crow. We have enough primary sources for those time periods. And the claim about culture sounds suspiciously like the heritage, not hate bumper stickers I see in reference to the Confederate flag. As a Southerner, I recognize that the Confederate flag is a part of that culture. That does not mean I will not make assumptions about those who support it or fly it. The flag and the monuments are signs of a failed rebellion. The United States may not be perfect, but as a daughter and granddaughter of veterans, it's the only country I have. The president's tweets are exactly why you cannot use 140 or 280 characters to try to talk about 150 years of history. And so, in spite of the president's best efforts, the following visuals are pretty much what people remember when they think about him and Charlottesville 2017. That was, that was published in The Guardian. This was published in The Economist. It actually won an award. Um, I take The Economist, so I used this cover when I was doing my anti-Judaism class in the fall of 2017. One would think after this debacle, the president would have taken some time off from weighing in about race. He took off about five weeks. 
In a September 22nd rally in Alabama for Republican candidate Luther Strange, the president compared taking a knee during the national anthem at NFL games to, quote, disrespecting our flag, stating, wouldn't you love to see one of those NFL owners when somebody disrespects our flag to say, excuse the language, get that son of a bitch off the field right now, out. He's fired. He's fired. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell and NFL Players Association Executive Director DeMarcus Smith both criticized the president's remarks. Besides the probable desire that the president would stay in his lane, their criticism also was based on the purpose of taking a knee. Colin Kaepernick began the protest as a way to bring attention to the police shootings of unarmed African American men. Initially, he began by sitting during the national anthem. After talking with veteran and former Green Beret Nate Boyer, however, Kaepernick chose to take a knee as a sign of respect for the United States flag. In an NPR interview, Boyer explained, quote, kneeling's never been in our history really seen as a disrespectful act. I mean, people kneel when they get knighted. You kneel to propose to your wife, and you take a knee to pray. And soldiers often take a knee in front of a fallen brother's grave to pay respects, end quote. The links among African Americans, sports, and politics are old ones. Tommy Smith and John Carlos's Black Power salute during the 1968 Mexico City Olympics is now an iconic symbol of protest, although at the time it cost both men their medals. Muhammad Ali's decision not to fight in Vietnam cost him several years of his career. In choosing to weigh in on taking a knee after the protest was already in its second year, the president is in line with the U.S. flag code. Having said that, his silence about the number of people wearing flag shirts and socks at his rallies, which is also a violation of the flag code, suggests that his comments were not politically or even racially neutral. The president's tweets confirm that suggestion. The next morning he typed, if a player wants the privilege of making millions of dollars in the NFL or other leagues, he or she should not be allowed to disrespect our great American flag or country and should stand for the national anthem. If not, you're fired. It's really big. Um, find something else to do. Besides the attempt of an outside public figure to dictate private business practice, the connection of protest with disrespect indicates a lack of knowledge about both words. Protest is an active movement against an injustice in an attempt to bring awareness of it and to inspire change. The United States historically is the result of revolution and protest. The Boston Tea Party is exhibit A here. Disrespect suggests treating someone or something with a lack of honor. One can debate about the proper behavior to display during the national anthem. As an Air Force brat, it drives me crazy to hear people singing along during the playing of the anthem. And such singing is not endorsed in the US code. I win. <laughs> but I don't. The singing may annoy me, but it is spontaneous and apparently tradition for some folks and I would be disrespecting them by pointing out in that moment that the correct response to the playing of the anthem is silence. The same argument could be applied to taking a knee. The action, just like singing, is not endorsed in the US code, but responses to the flag apparently vary with time and circumstance. One is not inevitably more problematic than the other. But the president decided that taking a knee had to stop, and he went to war about it with 14 tweets in one week about the issue. He insisted that the NFL make players stand for the anthem and fans should boycott games until this happened. Quote, if NFL fans refuse to go to games until players stop disrespecting our flag and country, you will see change take place fast, fire or suspend. The tweet came out at 3.44 a.m. on the morning of Sunday, September 24th, the first NFL Sunday since Trump started his war. The number of kneelers that Sunday was unprecedented. Before the president's comments, very few football players actually kneeled during the national anthem. Kaepernick himself was and still is out of a job. But that Sunday, players responded. The president continued to insist that kneeling was not acceptable. Players must stand. He also insisted that he was not trying to incite a racial conflict. Quote, this has nothing to do with race. I never said anything about race. This has nothing to do with race or anything else. This has to do with respect for our country and respect for our flag, end quote. The president tweeted the same point the following morning. The issue of kneeling has nothing to do with race. It is about respect for our country, flag, and national anthem. NFL must respect this. That comment was 99% of the problem because it indicated that the president either had no clue what started the kneeling in the first place 
or overlooked it for the sake of making a patriotic point. And as I mentioned in my comments about Charlottesville, who gets to be labeled patriotic in this country has historically been linked to race. When Thomas Jefferson said he was unsure whether former slaves could be citizens, he was expressing the common view that American equaled white. For the president to suggest that black NFL players and their white allies were somehow unpatriotic or less than fully American is not a new argument. But to say that the fight he chose to pick had nothing to do with race is simply untrue. Statistically, African Americans are more likely to be shot and killed by police than whites. In 2015, The Guardian decided to count the number of civilians killed by American police officers. The total was 1,134, with 15% of those killings being young, 177, being young black men ages 15 to 34. This demographic was nine times more likely to be killed by police. And so I just want to point out the first chart. Okay. Okay. When Kaepernick began his protest, it was in the light of these statistics and in the light of Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, and as it turns out, Laquan McDonald, to name only three. The president was wrong here. This has everything to do with race. It is not a coincidence that he started this fight at a Republican rally in Alabama with a heavily white Southern audience, more sympathetic to his argument than a racially diverse crowd in Cleveland. And so this is just, um, yeah, I can't click on the picture because otherwise you'll start with, the, it'll start the video of the rally and we well can't. But as you can see, it is pretty much a predominantly white crowd. The president rejoiced in the lower NFL ratings, arguing that they were a result of players not standing up for the national anthem. <coughs> On September 25th, he tweeted, hashtag stand for our anthem twice. The next day, he stated that there was great anger at the Dallas game when fans saw the players kneel. He concluded as follows, the NFL has all sorts of rules and regulations. The only way out for them is to set a rule that you can't kneel during our national anthem. On September 30th, the day before the next round of NFL Sunday games, the president reminded his followers that it was, quote, very important that NFL players stand tomorrow and always for the playing of our national anthem, respect our flag and our country, end quote. As the following months demonstrated, this did not happen. The NFL attempted to create a no kneeling rule, but backed down after complaints from the players union. Just when all seemed quiet, the Philadelphia Eagles won a dramatic Super Bowl 52. Several players stated that in support of Colin Kaepernick's protest and in opposition to the president's statements about such protests and other statements that to them showed a lack of racial enlightenment, they would not attend the customary White House ceremony for the Super Bowl winners. Once it became clear that most Eagles were not going to attend, the president disinvited the entire team on June 4th. Late that evening, he tweeted, the Philadelphia Eagles football team was invited to the White House. Unfortunately, only a small number of players decided to come, and we canceled the event. Staying in the locker room for the playing of our national anthem is as disrespectful to our country as kneeling. Sorry. The next day, the White House had a celebration with the Marine Corps band that included, quote, the national anthem and other wonderful music celebrating our country, honoring America, NFL, no escaping to locker rooms. The event itself gave the president the opportunity to criticize those who do anything other than stand for the national anthem in spite of the fact that no Eagles players either knelt or stayed in the locker room during the 2017-18 season. Although one would think the issue would be over with the new NFL season, the president wasn't quite finished. When two Miami Dolphins players knelt during their first preseason game in August, back to Twitter the president went. Quote, the NFL players are at it again, taking a knee when they should be proudly standing for the national anthem. Numerous players from different teams wanted to show their outrage at something that most of them are unable to define. They make a fortune doing what they love. Be happy, be cool. A football game that fans are paying so much money to watch and enjoy is no place to protest. 
Most of that money goes to the players anyway. Find another way to protest. Stand proudly for your national anthem or be suspended without pay. I will point out two things. First, the idea that players didn't know why they were kneeling minimizes both their social conscience and their intelligence. Considering that Kaepernick is still jobless and Eric Reed had so many random drug tests this past season that even outsiders wonder how random they were, the idea that players just knelt out of ignorance borders on foolish. Putting outrage in scare quotes suggests that the statistics mentioned earlier about police brutality are nothing to be upset about and that the players were not responding to them at all. From the president's perspective, the protest is the result of a manufactured, if not fictional, crisis. Second, the idea that earning a large paycheck means you should just smile and play ball and entertain the fans also borders on foolish. Employees are just that, employees. They are not slaves. If fans don't want to watch a game or pay to see it live, they can choose not to do so. And apparently they didn't. According to the NFL statistics, attendance for 2017 was 17,253,425, a decrease of 535,240 from 2016, or 3%. What the president did in his social media war with the NFL was solidify the support of his base and create a division among football fans based on race. As ESPN's The Undefeated noted on January 30th, just four weeks ago, and I'm quoting here, 80% of African-American NFL fans have a favorable view of Kaepernick, a view shared by just 36% of white fans, end quote. In the President's Super Bowl pregame interview, which was just a few weeks ago, he reaffirmed his opposition to kneeling for the national anthem, but also argued that the judicial reform bill he signed in December should eliminate the issue that caused the kneeling in the first place. Fingers crossed. While President Trump's responses to events involving race have been less than inclusive, one could argue that he would do a better job with religion. As many have noted, he has an overwhelming amount of support from white evangelicals. Vice President Pence is one of them. He has also presented himself as an advocate of Israel, declaring Jerusalem as Israel's capital in December 2017 and moving the U.S. Embassy there the following year. His daughter and son-in-law are practicing Orthodox Jews. So when an anti-Semitic man killed 11 people at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh on October 27th, this was an opportunity for the president to be what many of his supporters during the campaign said he would become if he was elected, namely presidential. And that day he was. As the news broke, the president tweeted, God bless all. He offered the support of the federal government to Pittsburgh's mayor and Pennsylvania's governor. In a statement early that afternoon at the Future Farmers of America convention in Indianapolis, the president called the shooting an anti-Semitic act and expressed surprise that such events still happened in the United States. He insisted that such an act, along with any form of racist or religious bias, was evil. Before he left Indianapolis, the president invited Rabbi Benjamin Sendro, a conservative rabbi, to offer a prayer for those in Pittsburgh. Shortly afterwards, the president tweeted, quote, all of America is in mourning over the mass murder of Jewish Americans at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. We pray for those who perished and their loved ones, and our hearts go out to the brave police officers who sustained serious injuries. This evil anti-Semitic act is an assault on humanity. It will take all of us working together to extract the poison of anti-Semitism from our world. We must unite to conquer hate. In the middle of good calls for unity and justice, the president made a comment about guns that began to open the floodgates, not only about appropriateness, but about whether the president's past problematic comments about racism were now coming home to roost. This has little to do with it if you take a look. If they had protection inside, uh, the results would have been far better. This is a dispute that will always exist, I suspect, but if they had some kind of a protection inside the temple, uh, maybe it could have been a very much different situation. They didn't. I think one thing we should do is we should stiffen up our laws in terms of the death penalty. When people do this, they should get the death penalty, and they shouldn't have to wait years and years. Now the lawyers will get involved. Anybody that does a thing like this to innocent people, that are in temple or in church. We had the, so many incidents with churches 
they should really suffer the ultimate price. They should pay the ultimate price. I felt that way for a long time. This is a case where if they had an armed guard inside, they might have been able to stop him immediately. So this would be a case for if there was an armed guard inside the temple, they would have been able to stop him. Maybe there would have been nobody killed except for him, frankly. As soon as the Sabbath ended, angry about the way he was being perceived, the president struck back on Twitter. The enemy, however, ended up being not anti-Semites, but reporters. Saturday evening, the president complained, quote, the fake news is doing everything in their power to blame Republicans, conservatives, and me for the division and hatred that has been going on for so long in our country. Actually, it is their fake and dishonest reporting that is causing problems far greater than they understand, end quote. There is no connection, however, between literal fake news, meaning the story is not true, and the shooter, Robert Bowers. Instead, there may have been a connection between white supremacist views of Jewish people and his decision to attack a synagogue. On one of his social media profiles, Bowers railed against the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society for bringing hostile invaders into the United States. Because one of the congregations advocating for immigrants met at the Tree of Life synagogue, Bowers decided to defend his country against those bringing in what he considered to be undesirables. The president's language about immigrants, legal and undocumented, is well known, and if it wasn't, the recent government shutdown has made his position fairly clear. What was not as well known is that Bowers' statement on his page that, quote, Jews are the children of Satan, end quote, was not his own invention. It is John 8:44. Bowers uses a biblical statement that helped create Christian anti-Judaism, along with anti-immigrant rhetoric, as justifications for murder. While there may be enough blame to go around, statistically speaking, those identifying as liberal have been less likely, at least in recent years, to hold public anti-immigrant or racist views than those self-identifying as conservative. If reporters are making that point, it is not because they are necessarily anti-conservative. People have to self-identify. The president slept on his tweet and woke up the next morning still unhappy. At dawn, he continued to protest about the media, quote, there is great anger in our country caused by inaccurate and even fraudulent reporting of the news. The fake news media, the true enemy of the people, must stop the open and obvious hostility and report the news accurately and fairly. That will do much to put out the flame of anger and outrage, and we will then be able to bring all sides together in peace and harmony. Fake news must end. Again, we have a failure to stay focused. Because the president had and has described negative news coverage as fake, he interpreted any association between Robert Bowers and rhetoric about immigration and Jewish people as an attack. One problem here is that the folks he called the enemy of the people are mainstream media journalists, and they did not motivate Robert Bowers. The good feeling that the president had created on Saturday was gone by Sunday. And the decision on Monday the 29th to visit Pittsburgh the next day did not go over well with the mayor or some Jewish groups. The mayor asked the president not to come until after the deceased had been buried. And one Pittsburgh group of Jewish people asked him not to come until he made a public statement against white nationalism. Disregarding these requests, the president went to the synagogue on Tuesday, October 30th. He and the first lady visited the memorial and talked privately with the synagogue's rabbi, Jeffrey Myers. Thousands protested his presence, including the family of Daniel Stern, whose funeral was that day. They refused to meet with the president because of his comments about the synagogue needing an armed guard. The day after the visit, the president, who had not tweeted about Pittsburgh in three days, sent this message.
Notice in the tweet, however, that the president did not mention the synagogue or the victims, something not lost on the people who tweeted back. This may be because it was the week before the midterm elections. The vast majority of the president's tweets between October 27th and November 1st concerned Republican candidates. At a November 1st rally in Columbia, Missouri, he made explicit what some had implied. His primary concern was the election. He said, quote, now, we did have two maniacs stop a momentum that was incredible, because for seven days, nobody talked about the elections. It stopped a tremendous momentum. More importantly, we have to take care of our people. And we don't care about momentum when it comes to a disgrace, like just happened to our country. But it did nevertheless stop a certain momentum, end quote. I will point out two things. First, the use of the word momentum four times suggests how important it was to the president. His argument is that had the shooting in Pittsburgh, among other events, not happened, then the Republican Party would have continued to gain attention and voters in the final days before the election. Second, we typically do not talk about something that does not interest us. The fact that the president said he did not care about momentum at a time of tragedy and yet mentioned it indicates that he did care. He cared enough to keep tweeting and campaigning while those in Pittsburgh buried their dead. That was his call to make. However, once again, it was a missed opportunity. The president could not stay focused on the tragedy and the mourners because it was the week before an election that he did not want his party to lose. And after the day of the shooting itself, the remaining tweets about Pittsburgh focused on how he had been mistreated by the media. Although flags flew at half staff from the 28th through the 31st, with few exceptions, presidential business went on as usual. My working thesis for this talk was that the president consistently overlooks the context within which he speaks. One of the premises of rhetorical criticism, and full disclosure, I'm a rhetorical critic, I study language, is that words do not exist in a vacuum. What we say enters a particular community and will be judged by others based on the communities in which they find themselves. Consequently, we cannot always be interpreted the way we would like. The president's comments about Charlottesville may have made sense to him, but they were spoken within the context of a white supremacist rally. By failing to condemn that rally unequivocally, the president intentionally or otherwise effectively supported it. Because of the United States' history of slavery and racial violence, the two sides argument only benefited the white nationalists. Similarly, by not acknowledging the context within which NFL players were taking a knee, the president turned a protest against police brutality into a litmus test for patriotism. While this may have energized his predominantly white political base, it once again showed a lack of knowledge about systemic racism and the ways in which bodies are presumed to have more or less value depending upon their color. The president's response on Super Bowl Sunday to questions about possible racial insensitivity was to tout low unemployment numbers for African Americans, as if somehow gainful employment should silence all criticism. And with the Tree of Life Synagogue, the noble attempts at unity and compassion were drowned out by a perceived sense of personal mistreatment, causing the president to focus on the media as the enemy and not on the anti-Semitic shooter. What all of these instances have in common is that if the president perceives himself or his base to be under threat, he lashes out. As the most powerful man in the United States and possibly the world, the president has privileges that most of us cannot even imagine. And as a wealthy white man, even if he had not become president, he would still be living incredibly well. What is most troubling to me about analyzing the president's rhetoric is how easily he sees himself as an aggrieved or oppressed party. He is neither. He has never been. And yet, a significant portion of his white working class base actually is under threat. Coal mines are closing. Steel mills are shutting down. These issues are class-based but historically in this country, race has almost always masked class. I began this paper with the Emanuel AME shooting in South Carolina. The antebellum history of the state may explain what we are seeing now. As scholars will tell you, the vast majority of white Southerners did not own slaves. They could not afford them. In South Carolina, the low country planters in places such as Charleston had wealth and resources that the upcountry South Carolinians in the western part of the state could not even imagine. But when one reads the 4th of July orations and the rhetoric leading up to the Civil War, wealthy planters and their supporters appeal to an idealized view of patriotism and civic pride as a way to convince poor whites that the slavery fight was theirs as well. The rhetoric has not changed at all. 
wealthy white men such as President Trump are still able to use race, albeit more subtly in some cases, to gain the confidence of poor and working class whites that they would not otherwise attract. After the 2016 election, numerous commentators argue that the Democrats must appeal to the white working class in order to win the 2020 election. The only way such an appeal can work, and we could argue about whether an appeal should happen, is whether the white working class actually sees itself as working class. If the primary identity is white, then no appeals to economic e equity will necessarily work. They haven't yet because such whites have always been able to claim racial superiority no matter how broke they were. Any visit to a Civil War cemetery will make that point. What our current political climate indicates is that the Civil War may be over, but the social problems that led to it are not. Unless we recognize the repetition of the rhetoric and call out the race baiting for what it is, I am not optimistic we will ever be free from 1865. Thank you.